Okay, so here we are. We're going to do a Kermit cam with a little bit of a voiceover so we can explain things. And uh, first off, we're going to start off with a cockpit check. Yeah, so this is the left side of the cockpit of our AT6D. Here we have the fuel selector. As you can see, it's in the off position currently. There's basically two fuel tanks in the center section, one on the right side, one on the left side, basically 55 gallons. And there's a selection over there uh, for a reserve that's actually in the left tank, and that allows you to uh, get absolutely the most uh, fuel out of that left tank, and generally we take off and land on the reserve. Okay, next up we're going to look at the, uh, uh, the trim and the wobble pump over there. The wobble pump handle uh, is the one in the middle of the two wheels. And uh, basically it's a, just a hand pump and you actually just wobble it uh, in case the, you know, the engine's not running, the engine driven pump. And that's how you would basically prime uh, the fuel to the carburetor prior to the engine starting. So you hand wobble up pressure, you can use the primer. Uh, there's a primer that squirts a cylinder, you know, fuel into the top of some of the cylinders for starting. And in case of the engine driven pump, once the engine starts starting, that's your primary fuel pump. But if the engine ever quit, you could actually hand pump the, uh, uh, the, the wobble pump there. If for some reason you ran a tank dry on a cross country or something and the engine quit and you swapped over to the other tank, you'd probably want to wobble that, uh, you know, to where you made sure that you had fuel pressure to get uh, fuel up to the carburetor as soon as possible. So the wheel closest to us is the elevator trim. As you can see, it rolls forward or backwards. The little notch in the top is kind of the neutral position. So if you roll it forward, uh, that NH implies nose heavy. So the nose would drop. If you rolled the wheel back, it would be tail heavy. The nose would come up. And in the back there, the rudder trim is basically a similar thing with a notch for neutral for takeoff and landing. And uh, you would roll it forward for right trim and roll it back for left trim. Okay, so we're back to the left side of the cockpit again. And now we're going to be looking at the throttle quadrant up here. And uh, basically you have your throttle mixture and propeller control with a, uh, a way to increase the friction. So first off, uh, the main handle there is the throttle, the big one. The little button on the side is a push to talk for the microphone for talking on the radio. The handle down below it there, the little red handle has a little notch. You can see it sits into the little indents there so it won't move. And that's basically your mixer control. Uh, when you shut the engine off, you basically it's an idle cutoff where it is now. For takeoff and starting, you would push it all the way forward. Once you're at altitude and you're cruising, depending on the altitude, you would lean the mixture back. And of course, the little notches are made so it won't move past that notch. That little black knob in the front there, it actually should say P on it. And that's your propeller, uh, basically, control for your constant speed prop. And full forward there, the propeller would be in fine pitch for takeoff. And once you got up to a cruise setting, you could actually uh, bring it back. The takeoff, I can't remember on this airplane, but it's, you know, full throttle is up to the red line. And then once you start cruising, you would start bringing that back to set the RPM for the engine. And the prop would basically change pitch uh, through the governor, depending on whether or not you were climbing or diving or uh, different changes in attitude. Down there at the bottom, there's a little knob that says increase uh, friction. And the, what you do with there is, uh, you know, on takeoff, you want to be able to push the throttle forward. If for some reason you got to reach over and grab something, the, the hydraulic uh, handle for uh, adding pressure to put the landing gear handle up and down. And the landing gear handle is on the left side, so you would not want the throttle to creep back. So you would adjust that friction to where the throttle could still move, uh, but you would basically want to make sure that, uh, you know, it didn't move unless you pulled it uh, with some reasonable amount of pressure. Here we're looking at the landing gear uh, control system and uh, forward there you can see the little red handle there says landing gear. Uh, that's actually the lever to raise and lower the landing gear and as you can see there's a little notch there and it's in the down position right now. If we were to raise the landing gear on takeoff the first thing that we would actually do is there's a little yellow handle on the back there that says push on it 
And what we would do is we would push that. That would actually uh, pressurize the hydraulic system, which in this airplane, uh, it eventually goes back to zero. So you have to push that handle, pressurize the system. Once the system pressure is up there, you would grab the landing gear handle in the front. You would pull it inboard to get that uh, notch, uh, you know, the little tab there out of the detent. You would pull the landing gear up and it would lock uh, into that detent in the above there. And then the landing gear would come up. It would finish its cycle when the, the pressure would put the landing gear up all the way, but then what would happen was eventually, after a certain time period, that little hydraulic handle in the back there, it would release itself and the pressure would go back to zero. The other handle up there that says flap on it uh, is basically your flap selector, and uh, uh, currently it's probably in the, uh, it's either in the neutral position or the down, anyway, it has a, an up, a neutral, and a down position. And so what would, uh, what would happen is when you wanted to operate the flaps, normally it would be in the neutral position. You would push the hydraulic uh, handle in the back there, the little pressure thing to increase the pressure. Then you would move the handle back uh, for it to go down uh, and then uh, go back to neutral. At some point, the little pressure handle would come back and then the pressure would go back to zero. When you wanted to put the flaps back up, you would have to push the handle back down, push the flap handle forward, uh, and you know, and it would do the same thing. So you can actually see there above it says wing flaps, lock, down, up. Lock is basically the neutral position. And then over here on the uh, lower right is actually uh, an emergency hydraulic hand pump. Obviously if the engine's not running, it's not creating any hydraulic pressure off the engine driven pump, but you do have a way to manually pump uh, the flaps up and down when the engine's not running or in the case of an emergency. And that handle there actually is kind of in a lower stowed position. It has the ability, you can kind of grab it, rotate it slightly. You can actually pull it up and make it, extend it to make it a little bit longer. Uh, it'll lock back into the long position and then you can pump it and uh, you know, it's a, a little bit uh, you know, easier to pump because you got a little bit more leverage with a longer handle. Okay, up here is the uh, carburetor air. And basically, uh, we're always pretty much flying around here with carburetor heat cold. It's off. And uh, if you ever got into any kind of icing conditions, maybe flying through the clouds or something like that, or if the engine started running a little bit of rough in, in high moisture uh, positions where you might start picking up a little carburetor ice, you would basically push that little handle in there. You could see how it would come out of the detent in that little notch curve thing there. And basically, you would uh, adjust that to set the, uh, uh, the carburetor temp a little bit warmer and try and uh, burn that ice out or melt the ice out, basically. Okay, over here forward of the uh, the trim and the wobble pump uh, thing, there's a little panel there. You can see at the front there, there's some circuit breakers. And if one of them popped out, you would push it in to reset it. On the upper middle there, you have a flap position indicator. So right now, uh, the flaps are about halfway down at 20 degrees. Uh, just below that, you've got your uh, left and right landing gear indicators. And uh, then over behind that, you've got the pressure, hydraulic pressure. So normally, the hydraulic pressure is zero on the airplane unless you go back and you engage that handle. When you push that handle down in the back, it'll engage the pressure. Then you move the landing gear or the, uh, the flaps to do whatever you want to do. And then uh, it should basically cycle. And uh, then the hydraulic pressure will stay up for a little bit and eventually release. If for some reason the gear or the flaps didn't complete their cycle before the system pressure uh, you know, went to zero, you could always push the handle again and make sure. Uh, so what, what you want to do is make sure that the, uh, the pressure's up when it's in the position. And in case of the landing gear, there's actually some visual uh, locks that you can actually look out on the wing outside the cockpit, both left and right, and confirm that the, uh, the, the landing gear is locked. The flaps don't have that ability other than just the indicator right there. Okay, here we are looking at the, uh, the basic uh, main instrument panel. And up here is basically your vacuum uh, suction pressure gauge. And what that does, it's a negative pressure that runs, uh, you know, some of your gyro instruments like the directional gyro and the artificial horizon. Here's your altimeter. 
And of course, you can see that the, uh, the, the big hand basically measures hundreds of feet. And the little hand, uh, once the little hand or the big hand went all the way around, the little hand basically measures thousands of feet. So if you were at 1,000 feet, the little hand would be on the 1, and the big hand would be on the 0. Currently, we're reading 100 feet. Down below here to the left, we've got the mag switch. It's currently in the off position. You have two mags uh, on the engine, a left, a right, and then for both for flying. And prior to uh, takeoff, we check, uh, you know, check both of them. They would be on both. We would go, we'd run the engine up to a certain RPM, and we'd basically check, uh, go to the left mag, go back to both, go to the right mag, go over both. And we're looking for, you usually get like a 50, sometimes a 75 RPM drop. Sometimes if the plugs are fouled or something, you know, it might be a little bit more. And a lot of times what will happen is, uh, you know, if you take off, uh, sometimes it'll it'll clear up right away and it'll be fine when you come back and land. So, uh, But basically you're looking for about a, a 50, 50 drop uh, on your run-up check. Over on the left there in the uh, left side there is a manifold pressure gauge drain and sometimes you get a little bit of water in the, uh, uh, the manifold pressure line and what they're trying to do is basically uh, have a drain at the low point kind of like when you drain the try to drain water out of your fuel tanks and stuff so currently it's closed. Here we've got our magnetic wet compass and that compass is basically like your normal Boy Scout compass uh, at some point, uh, we would use that uh, to adjust our directional gyro, which we would use while we were flying instruments and stuff. The directional gyro uh, comp basically, uh, you know, stays pretty steady, but when you bank and you turn with a wet compass, it'll tend to wobble around a little bit, so it's not so good for instrument flying if you're doing a lot of turns. And here we've got our airspeed indicator. As you can see, we've got a, a red line of the airplane at about 245 miles an hour. That's a never exceed speed. Here's your directional gyro, and we would adjust this to the wet compass. If the wet compass was stable, we would set it to our, uh, our compass heading. So, uh, somewhere there's a compass correction card um, that would uh, might be a little variable. In Florida, there's no deviation. So basically, uh, uh, you would just basically line up the wet compass and then you would adjust the directional gyro. Sometimes before takeoff, uh, the runway headings are all lined up to magnetic uh, headings. So like on Fantasy of Flight, if I was taken off, headed kind of to the southwest, you know, I would know that I was lining up on runway 22. I would adjust my directional gyro to 22, 220 degrees on the uh, directional gyro. And the little knob at the bottom is what you do to, uh, to make the adjustments. Okay, here we've got our turn and slip indicator, and uh, the the little ball there will tell you whether or not you're slipping or skidding, and the little needle at the top during instrument conditions will tell you if you're turning to the right or to the left, and uh, that's basically to uh, you know fly instruments and also you know maintain coordinated turns. Down here we've got a marker beacon that says push the test, and that would basically be had this airplane had been set up at one point for doing uh, you know a more modern ILS approach. Uh, none of that equipment's in the airplane right now, so we don't use that. And down here, here's another World War II instrument that we don't use. It's a radio compass. It would have been something they would have used for navigation back then, but uh, we no longer use that. Over here is your uh, artificial horizon, and that would be a primary instrument to watch when you were uh, flying in instrument conditions. Uh, currently, the, the vacuum system over on the left is not running. And the vacuum gauge would basically spin up the gyro in that, and uh, the horizon would come up. And basically, your little uh, two wings and the dot is your airplane and the airplane. So if this thing was actually flying right now, we would be in a slightly climbing left turn. Um, and then the way you cage it to basically, before you take off, or if you're going to do aerobatics, you want to lock the system, and you would basically turn that knob, it says to cage there to the right, it would lock everything in place. If you were going to do aerobatics, you can do the same thing with a directional gyro to the left there with the little uh, cage and button at the bottom that you would push it in and lock it. Once you wanted to fly instruments, you could cage that when you knew that you were in a level attitude, uncage it, and basically the horizontal bar and the airplane wings on the artificial horizon would be lined up. Here you've got a rate of climb indicator, and as you can see, the big numbers are in thousands of feet per minute, up and down. Down here we've got our three-in-one gauge. Um, at the top, you basically have your oil temperature, 
and you've got your minimum 40 degrees that we would use uh, have at least before we did our run up and before we took off and then there's a red line there of 100 degrees centigrade uh, down to the left we've got our oil pressure gauge so you've got oil pressure down to the lower left oil temp to the upper right and then down to the right you've got your fuel pressure gauge and as you can see you've got your little red lines in there where you want to make sure that you maintain them here you've got your RPM gauge and on takeoff the airplane basically with the propeller full forward and full throttle would turn up 2300 RPM uh, after takeoff we would basically uh, bring it back to you know probably 2100 2000 RPM uh, depending on how fast we wanted to climb and once we get up to cruise you know you would bring the propeller control back uh, and the governor would basically maintain the RPM you set on the RPM gauge there and I think we I cruised this around 1850 or 1900 RPM this is the manifold pressure gauge and uh, this is a supercharged engine uh, normally uh, probably the most pressure you're ever going to get is around 30 inches at sea level and uh, so basically obviously the, uh, the airplane can is boosted up to 36 inches you can see the red line on the gauge there and so basically you know when you took off with full RPM uh, and full manifold pressure it would go up to the 36 inches um, and it's interesting on the T6 there's not a stop here uh, that's a mechanical or anything and so it's very very important you can over boost this engine easily so on takeoff as you're pushing up the throttle you actually have to watch that gauge to make sure you don't go beyond the red line because if you continued pushing the throttle forward you would exceed that red line there that's not good for the engine for cruise we would set the rpm at about 1850 rpm on the gauge above there and then down below i think i pretty much cruise around 25 26 inches of manifold pressure over here's your cylinder head temperature and you're uh, pretty much before you do your run up uh, before your takeoff you want to have at least 100 degrees uh, degrees on the uh, on the cylinder head temp and pretty much most of the red lines on these, although it's not marked on the gauge, is up in the kind of like the 290 range, somewhere up around in there. Down here we've got the low fuel pressure light, and if for some reason the fuel pressure started getting uh, below what would normally require to run the airplane, either because the uh, you were running out of fuel, your one tank was about to go dry, or you were, um, uh, you know, the engine-driven pump was starting to, uh, you know, give up the ghost or something like that that light would come on and give you a warning to where you know you either need to switch tanks or you need to start wobbling with the manual hand pump to make sure that you maintain that fuel pressure over on the triple pressure gauge uh, between the two little red lines there over here we've got the carburetor air temperature gauge and that would be basically used for uh, making sure that if you were uh, getting into icing conditions you know you might want to adjust use that to adjust your carburetor heat uh, control which is down on the left side there when we first started and uh, you know basically uh, you know maintain a certain temperature to keep any ice getting in the carburetor which could you know start getting the airplane to you know start running rough okay moving down here uh, to the lower panel down here on the lower left here we've got kind of the kind of electrical panel here on the upper left we've got the ammeter and that basically tells you that the uh, the generator is putting out uh, power to charge the battery and maintain the electrical system and it basically uh, that just shows you know how much power it's putting out to the right there we've got the left and right those are uh, you know dimmer lights for the cockpit for flying at night down below that in the middle we've got the battery we would turn that on to turn the battery on uh, the little disconnect down below there would be if you were going to use an external battery cart or something like that you know in case the battery was low or dead or for some reason you wanted to use that and then once you started and you pulled the external cart off you would actually turn the battery on so that's the battery that's the master switch just to, to, to the right of that is the generator switch so the generator would be uh, you know on uh, and the generator really doesn't come on line until you get up about you know, probably 1500 rpm and then you'll see the ammeter pop up there and you would look at that and check that that was working on your range and run up there's some more cockpit lights to the right of that to the right of that is the oil dilution switch in really really cold conditions I'm sure this is not connected on our airplane right now uh, you would uh, like if you were up in Alaska or Siberia or something like that and it was really cold 
uh, based on how cold it was going to be the next time you started the engine. You actually, there's a chart in the manual that uh, you would look at and you would actually flick that switch up and you're actually taking fuel out of the fuel tank and you're putting it into the oil system to dilute the oil system so it's not so thick the next time you start it when it's really cold. Just to the right of that is the starter switch. Uh, this particular one is uh, wired for direct cranking, it says. Yeah, some of the early ones had basically a, uh, an energizing starter, an inertial starter that you could either hand crank or you could actually wind it up to a certain point and uh, uh, energize it. And then at some point you flick the switch over and it actually engages it. And at that point, the engine would start turning. This particular one, as soon as you flick the switch, uh, it starts cranking. That was kind of a later thing they came up with. Okay, so down here we basically just have a panel with a lot of the light switches. Uh, starting on the left is the landing lights. Uh, they're located in the leading edge of the wing and they're used to uh, see the runway at night. We've got some kind of passing lights there. There's fuel gauge lights that basically light the fuel gauges up so you can see them at night down below the uh, east side of the seat in the cockpit. Uh, pedo heat basically, uh, there's actually, you can heat the pedo tube which is out uh, in the, you know, under one of the wings there for making sure that it doesn't ice up so you don't lose your airspeed and your altimeter. Uh, position lights, I believe that's probably your nav lights that are flying at night. We don't fly this thing at night. And then there's a strobe light, which is actually a, a, modern, uh, a modern light that's been added. Over on the right there is a rheostat for some kind of lights that I'm sure are not hooked up because they're not marked. None of that's used to date. Okay, so down here on the right we've got an old piece of radio equipment. It's basically an ADF. It was used for navigation. Yeah, and then in the upper left there, we basically just got a, a comm receiver transmit radio. Down below that is a transponder. Currently, it's set to 1200. Generally, when you're flying around in, uh, you know, airport areas and things like that, you know, you want to let people know where you are. Uh, if you're not talking to anybody, you basically squawk 1200. That's a VFR frequency. If you were in instrument conditions, they would give you a specific code, and that would basically uh, broadcast your specific code, and they would know exactly... Uh, where you were. Down below that's just part of the intercom system so I can talk to the passenger in the back seat. And on the uh, the control stick there in the middle uh, there's a little button on the top. That's actually for the intercom uh, to talk if I want to talk to the control tower or something like that. I use the one on the throttle and the one on the stick there is if I want to talk to the passenger in the back. Down below here we've got our rudder pedals and uh, it's kind of interesting. These are adjustable. You can't see them very obviously but to the uh, the inside of each rudder pedal there's actually uh, an opportunity there to uh, push that inboard and you can actually move the pedal forward or backwards on a track there and adjust the uh, the length for uh, you know different uh, length leg people in the upper right there that's the fuel primer and we would wobble up pressure manually before the engine started you know to get some pressure and then we would uh, uh, pull that handle out it actually locks to the right we would unlock it to the left we would pull the handle out and as you started wobbling up the pressure you could see the pressure coming up on the gauge you can actually hear the fuel filling up the primer there and once it was full you could push that in and it probably takes you know, maybe a squirt, squirt and a half, maybe two squirts, you know, to, before we start the engine. It depends kind of on the temperature uh, and the, the engine. The pilot gets to know that after a while. Over on the left side, there's a parking brake. Um, to operate the brakes, it's, you can see on the rudder pedals, depress pedal to release parking brake. Well, if you push on the tops of the pedals there, that gives you the brake, the right brake or the left brake, depending on which one you're pushing. To set the parking brake, you would push the tops of both the pedals down. You would pull that parking brake handle out, and the way you would hold the handle out, release the pedals, let the handle go, and it bra basically allows the brakes where before you were pushing on them, it keeps the, the pressure in the hydraulic system to the brakes to where you now have a parking brake. Um, they did this on Army airplanes, but for obvious reasons, they never had parking brakes on Navy airplanes because they didn't want them have them set on the carrier deck, and then all of a sudden somebody would try to move the airplane and the brakes were set. So on a Navy airplane, on a carrier, they would always use chalks. That was just part of their uh, modus operandi. Um, down, uh, you can see the, uh, it says oil cooler. There's actually a little knob there, and if you push that little black 
lever in there, uh, full, uh, push it in, it disengages the, uh, the detents there. You can move that around. You can basically open and close the, uh, the kind of some, some vents to the oil cooler. So around Florida, we just leave it open all the time because it's so warm. If you got into a colder climate and you started seeing the oil temperature starting to drop on your oil temperature gauge, the three-in-one gauge, you would actually close that to a point to maintain the oil temperature that you wanted. Down on the bottom there, you can see two little uh, vents. One says hot air, and the other one on the left is cold air. And in Florida, we pretty much leave the hot air one closed, and the one on the left is cold air. So I get to, uh, you know, blow some cold air um, on my face while I'm flying, and if I haven't got the canopy open. Okay, so now coming down the control stick here, there's actually a there's a control locking system. And what you do is you basically uh, hold the stick into a certain position. This little control lock handle here, you actually you kind of move it forward or you adjust the deal in there and it kind of clicks into a, a notch in the stick and when you let it go, it locks the stick into position. Once the stick is locked into position, you can actually move the rudder pedals and when they get to the neutral position, it will also lock the control uh, the controls for the rudder as well. And you know, if you come into land somewhere in an airport and you're gonna you know go get some fuel or something like that or you're tying it down for the night you want to control uh, put the control locks in because you don't want the uh, the ailerons or the rudder or the elevators flapping around you know in the breeze so this uh, is a mechanical uh, lock for all three uh, axes of controls and uh, you know it's great yeah so over here we've got the uh, the right fuel gauge and it's down to the right uh, the pilot seat uh, down low on top of the center section because the fuel tank is in the center section and over here we've got the left fuel gauge and as you can see there's some little electrical connections to the front there and that little kind of a curve part there is actually a light which uh, allows you to see uh, you know what the fuel is at night um, and as you can see there on the left one we've got marked in red the reserve uh, section there so I think uh, that was 26 gallons as I remember and uh, once you get into the red you know it's a warning you better have some fuel in the right tank or you better be finding an airport very soon and over here we're just showing a panel that was uh, pretty much all World War II uh, stuff uh, the in original intercom system and stuff like that none of that is used today and over in the back there we've got like a little map case this is actually how you get in the cockpit and uh, and close the canopy. Uh, when if you're inside the cockpit and the canopy is pushed forward and closed, you would actually pull that little red handle to the inside, and it would unlock the canopy where you could slide it back. Uh, if you're coming up the airplane, you left it overnight. Then what you do is you would actually lift up that little uh, gray. Uh, pin on the outside which would unlock the inside and allow you to basically from the outside push the canopy back and get in the airplane. Okay so here we're basically uh, checking the controls getting all ready to take off. I've got the stick forward because I'm taxiing out looking at my watch I've got the canopy adjusted uh, with a little bit of a, an opening. By now I would have pulled the stick back. I would have wiggled the uh, rudder pedals to line up the, lock the tail wheel. Here we go, getting some speed. I would look down at the uh, manifold pressure setting to make sure I didn't exceed 36 inches on takeoff. Getting the tail up, lifting off. I'm gonna look down to the left, I'm gonna push that power lever, get pressure, pull the landing gear handle up. Landing gear should be coming up. And once the landing gear comes up, at some point the hydraulic pressure will still stay and then go down to zero. I was just basically pointing to the manifold pressure gauge and the uh, tachometer, so now I'm running for climb at about 30 inches at about 2,000 RPM. Still got uh, full mixture rich. We don't bring the mixture back until we've set up for cruise and we've set the, uh, the throttle setting and the RPM back down to where they're at a cruise setting. So you got pretty good visibility out of this at uh, reasonably high. Fan 
ESA flight off the right there. A lot of lakes around where uh, where I'm currently located with the NSA flight, so it's great to have some seaplanes. There we've got the Connie sitting at the end of the long runway. And hopefully one day that big open field behind where the white hangar is and the main entrance is, is going to be Fantasy Flight Act 3. And we're still climbing. Close the canopy there. You see how I pulled the handle in and then pushed it forward. Now we're adjusting the speed. Oh, it looks to me like we're going to do a roll. I didn't waste any time, did I? I was just having too much fun. I was trying to get up it so I could do a roll. Maybe drop the nose a little bit. Pick the nose up. I think we're going to do a four-point roll here. One. Two. Keeping it positive. And basically, I'm still being pushed in my seat at the, at the inverted position there because I'm still pulling the nose through. Uh, I wouldn't have weighed my normal self. I would have lightened myself up like I wish I weighed. Lots of somebody off there. I don't know who that is. Might be from one of the local theme parks. I'm going to have to shoot them down. I'm sorry. They've invaded my space. Oh, I got them. <laughs> Bye. Anyway, you can see there's still a lot of swamp around. We're actually at the southern end of the green swamp. A lot of the... Uh, uh, open area there is used for uh, cattle and stuff. You know, there's still there's still oranges, uh, but not as many as there used to be in Central Florida. Just basically looking at the uh, setting up for cruise. For uh, so I'm bringing the throttle back and the and the RPM back to probably about uh, 26 inches of manifold pressure and about 1850 um, on the RPM. A little bump there up on the right side was actually uh, a blister for a 30 caliber machine gun. There's actually one on the left here. I'll have to look to see if. Uh... Oh, that was a snap roll. Not the greatest recovery, but basically uh, you can do that at about 120 miles an hour. Yeah, so so. About 120 miles an hour is a good snapping speed. I actually flew. Uh, the sportsman aerobatic sequence in competition one time. The problem with the T6 is you couldn't keep it in the box. You, you, by the time you did a slow roll in the middle, you go out the one end. That's another snap. That's a little bit better. The T6 has an air, is an airplane that would actually snap very, very good. It's such a great trainer because it's got that kind of tapered leading edge. And if you get slow and you get that ball uh, out of the center, and you pull back at some point, man, that thing will snap, and you know, I've spun it and everything too, so. And we played around at altitude, so now I'm just cracking the canopy to somebody else down there. Oh my God, I might be an ace by the time I land. Here we go, uh, going down a local strip here. It appears that I'm going too fast, so I'm probably gonna have to do a bulk landing. Yeah, I was going too fast to land, so. I like it to go around. Now, I don't know if you can notice, but I'm starting to get a little bit of oil on the windshield. I fly with numerous rags in this airplane, and I don't know why, but I had a I had a T6G prior to this, and they were both the same. Um, so I don't know. Maybe everybody else has got a T6 that doesn't leak oil, but every one I, I've had, I'm always, you know, you know, basically having to wipe the windshield with a rag every once in a while. Fortunately, I have long arms. Yeah, and anytime I'm cruising around, occasionally I'm just, you know, I'm looking at the oil temp, fuel pressure, uh, you know, oil pressure for sure, and, uh, you know, just double checking everything, making sure nothing's creeping. That over there, um, part of that is my orange grow. And a 
USA flight over there on the upper right. And we're flying down uh, a little lake here. When I originally bought Fantasy of Flight, there was three pieces of property um, where the runway cuts in that big tree thing in the middle there. One of the pieces was south of that. One of them was north where Fantasy of Flight is. And what I'm about to fly over was another piece which I purchased. What I'm flying over right now to protect my approach to make sure somebody didn't build a house on the end of my runway. So, so I'm flying over the second piece and now I'm flying basically over the third piece down there to the right. So. They were completely independent owners, and when I first bought the property, I didn't know if I was going to be able to get them all together, So, but eventually I did, and the rest is history. The reason our runways are grass is because we fly airplanes also from you know the early days uh, that had no brakes and used, used tail skids. So, and you know, a lot, most of the airfields in World War II over in England and stuff, they had to build them really fast and uh, they operated out of grass fields. It wasn't uh, the more permanent ones used the, uh, the concrete runways. Got a B-25, got a Connie. Got a little camp down there. They haven't complained about my flying over. They're mainly there on weekends. Yeah, you can see a lot of oranges around there. They're still there, people trying to make a living with them. Uh, since that time, some of those don't exist anymore <laughs> due to greening and citrus canker and anyway, property values going up. Making a little bit of an angle coming in on my short runway there just to make a flyby. See our little DC-3 road icon down there. I don't think you can see it, but the G. Willie sitting on top is actually waving as we go by. That's Interstate 4 down there. Coming back, I think we're probably one last pass. Pitching up, looking down, just push the mixture forward. Now I'm basically going to push the power handle in to get some hydraulic pressure. And the first thing I'll probably do once I get to altitude is to drop the gear. And actually if you look out there on the wing you can see there's a little clear panel and on each side you can actually see when the top of the landing gear locks into position. That's basically, it's a visual lock. Here I've got my rag out getting ready to clean the windshield so I can see where I'm going when I land. That is a uh, required uh, accessory in, a, in an AT-6. In every airplane I fly I always have rags. You never know when you're going to need one. the canopy all the way back and we'll start milking the flaps in push the power handle there oh there goes the gear right there okay so you actually saw it now we're looking for it's coming up see the little white thing there click and to the left and the other one's in there so the two little white things there is what you're looking for and I can actually see that goes into place and then the pin goes in after that and basically you can actually see that it's down and locked. Then at some point we're basically, you know, setting the RPM uh, for a go around. And I would probably set it up to about 2,000 RPM. I got the throttle back, so it actually would never do that. But right before I land, I would push the prop in all the way, make sure in all the way and uh, in case you had to do a go around. Runway's up to the left. See the 
GoPro on my head and the shadow on the way. And we've got some trees to go over as well as some power lines. And when I first got to uh, Fantasy of Flight and I put the runway in, I said, uh, you know, y'all need to put some orange balls on those power lines. I said, why? Because I'm, my landing gear might take them out one day. And very shortly, they, uh, they put some balls on the power lines. You couldn't really see them there, but trust me, they're there. And we come in to land. Slow down. We're always going to do a three-point. Those little three mushrooms off to the left there is basically the end of my runway when we're landing that way. We can use it all for takeoff, but uh, technically that's where we're supposed to land past that um, for the FAA. And the Fantasy of Flight runway is just basically used for uh, for day day VFR when the weather's weather's good for flying. Uh, okay, so I'm probably still steering with the tail wheel because the stick is at least in the middle position. Okay, put the flaps up. Got pressure. That is the flap handle going up. Flap coming up. Flaps are up, back to neutral. Now we test turn to see which way we're going. You might hit a cow or an alligator. And at this point, I have the stick forward, and I'm actually using a little bit of brake to taxi because I want to see what's in front of me. like a pretty nice day at Fantasy of Flight. A couple of P-51s over on the right there. Before I bought a Mustang, which was my dream airplane, I had really no interest in an AT-6. It was the first Warbird that I bought because it was what I wanted to learn in what the World War II guys learned in. And I owned one for about six months. I'd flown it across country, given lots of rides. I flew it once in an aerobatic contest in Sportsman. And... Uh, then eventually the P-51 uh, came up, and I bought it, and uh, never looked back. And that was my first P-51 over there, the Blue Nose one, Craps Almighty. Coolest day of my life, taxing into a ramp full of my friends when I was 25 years old. Now at some point here, I'm going to push the stick forward, and I'm going to spin the airplane around, or start taxiing with the brakes to be able to turn it tight like this. There's no way to do that with a tailwheel lock. So I would have pushed the stick forward, I would have tapped on the left brake, would have spun around. The T6, it actually has a, uh, an exposed cylinder on the prop deal, so we generally run it up to about 1,500 RPM for a little bit. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the engine up to 1,500 RPM. I'm gonna let the engine scavenge the oil out of the engine as much as possible. There's a pump on the bottom of the engine. It'll put it back in the oil tank. And after about 30 seconds uh, of scavenging oil, I'm gonna pull the prop back. You'll hear the RPM drop and that'll cover that cylinder uh, on the T6 prop here so it doesn't get any rust on it. So here we go up to 1500. I go. I've just pulled the uh, propeller back. I'm allowing it to drop back to course pitch setting to cover that cylinder so it doesn't rust. Once that's done, I shut the engine off with the mixture. Sign my logbook, and I'm off. Mags, master, fuel. That's what I always do. The mags are off, the master's off, and uh, we make sure that the fuel is off down there to the lower left. Cool. Thank you for flying with me.
Life is good.